Okay, everyone, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Gen North America webinar series. My name is Yerado Abrahamian from the Gen North America Steering Group, and I am the moderator for today's webinar on Grades Evidence and Decision Framework. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the American Academy of Neurology for kindly allowing us access to their webinar platform today. We appreciate your generosity. In case we have participants who are new to the Gen North America webinar series, please allow me to go over a few brief slides to address who we are, what we do, and why it would be great for you or your organization to consider membership. So GIN stands for Guidelines International Network, and GIN is the largest guidelines network in the world that we know of. It was founded in 2002. Its mission is to lead, strengthen, and support collaboration and guideline development, adaptation, and implementation worldwide. In 2017, it had 103 organizational members, 156 individual members, and 47 countries, to, uh, countries represented. I am sure the number has grown since then, and we will report that at our next um, webinar. If you'd like more information on GIN, please visit the website at gin-i-n.net. There are many ways to get involved in GIN as it, operates in as it operates in multiple work groups listed on your screen, as well as regional groups, and we are one of the biggest regional groups in GIN. The benefits of GIN membership include, but are not limited to, access to the GIN Library of Clinical Practice Guidelines, shared evidence tables and systematic reviews, access to experts and colleagues, um, participation in working groups or regional groups, um, discounts on annual co um, the annual conference, um, access to the project board, as well as free access to Dynamed. Uh, for more information on membership, please visit the GIN website. Um, and under its membership tab. GIN North America is a regional community of GIN, and we are a group of users, developers, and researchers from Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. interested in clinical, the field of clinical practice guidelines. Um, we host um, webinars every other month, um, regional events, as well as share and collaborate on a number of projects. We do have a page on the GIN website, and it can be accessed at the um, URL you're seeing on your screen. So let's move on to today's webinar. In our 2018 webinar portfolio, in addition to featuring ongoing and completed research, we have and continue to feature a number of innovative tools available to guideline developers. Today's webinar is a novel resource for guideline developers, Grades Evidence to Decision Framework. This tool was created to help guideline developers when the answer is not found in high quality evidence, but there remains a need for a decision or recommendation. Today's talk is going to be given by Dr. Eddie Lang, who is the academic and clinical department head and an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Cummings School of Medicine at University of Calgary. He is also the scientific director of the Emergency Strategic Clinical Network with Alberta Health Services. He co-chaired the 2007 Academic Emergency Medicine Consensus Conference on Knowledge Translation, which remains an ongoing interest. Dr. Lang is a member of the GRADE Working Group and has led the development of GRADE-based clinical practice guidelines in pre-hospital care in the U.S. and is currently engaged in the same activity with the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. Dr. Lang is also an award-winning educator, having received recognition at both the university, national, and international levels. He also serves as Senior Associate Editor for the Canadian Journal of Emergency Medicine and Associate Editor for the ACP Journal Club and the International Journal of Emergency Medicine. And he is an active member of the GIN North America Steering Group. As you can see, Dr. Lang is a very busy man, and we are very grateful that he took time to speak with us today. In terms of ReadyTalk 
uh, webinar platform housekeeping, please note that all participants were muted upon entry to the meeting to ensure a smooth recording of the session. Please do not unmute yourself, and please do not place us on hold. If necessary, please leave the me meeting and dial back into the meeting. We have allotted 30 minutes for questions at the end of the presentation. Throughout the presentation, please submit your questions directly to the chairperson at the lower left of your screen. We will convey all your questions to Dr. Lang at the end of this session. The slides and recording of this webinar will be made available on the GEN website within a week. Also, please note that our next webinar is in two weeks on December 13th. Our speaker is Yvonne Flores, who will discuss the use of clinical practice guidelines beyond the clinical encounter, how CPGs impact policy and funding. This session will be moderated by our immediate past chair, Melissa Browers. So please remember to register for the webinar before December 13. If you don't have registration info, please email gin-na at g-i-n.net. Okay, Eddie, I think we're ready for you. Oh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much, Urato. This is such a kind introduction, and uh, I am just so thrilled and happy to be here. I've been a big fan of these uh, webinars to be able to present one is a real privilege. Uh, just doing a quick audio check, is, are, is everybody able to hear me okay? And um, Yes, that's perfectly clear. Okay, great. Well, so thanks uh, for this opportunity to present on the Evidence to Decision Framework, a topic uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, just wanted to mention, that, yeah, there is a dog in the, in the story. <laughs> That uh, often comes around when, uh, when the mailman or someone else visits the door, but that shouldn't be too much of a, of a nuisance. I um, just thought I would get some disclosures out there. Uh, Urato mentioned a couple of these things. Uh, the way uh, my academic career has evolved uh, has m had me essentially kind of coming by happenstance into the role of a grade methodologist uh, through a combination of factors, uh, being a big fan of the work coming out of McMaster and other things. Uh, so as a result, I've had extraordinary privilege of working uh, to support a number of guideline projects, including the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, which you may recognize as making uh, CPR guidelines for resuscitation councils around the world, like the Heart and Stroke Foundation in Canada, the American Heart Association, and uh, groups in Europe and, Eurasia and, and Oceania and in Asia. Um, the, I've done some stuff with uh, a vaccine uh, pain and fear group. Uh, most recently, I've been uh, at the American Society of Hematology uh, working on a VTE diagnosis guideline, uh, which just got published a few days ago in Blood Advances. And uh, we like to think of it as a great model for grade in the diagnosis uh, context. Uh, and have also been working with the sickle cell disease group uh, and, the, and the pain panel. Um, and the WHO as well, uh, I've had the privilege of working on a pediatric resuscitation uh, guideline for them with GRADE, and most of these have been volunteer, but some of them have involved uh, some consulting fees. Uh, one of the volunteer groups I'm with, um, I'm really excited about, is something called the Canadian Task Force for Preventive Healthcare. And this is, you may not be familiar with this, but it's basically the um, Canadian version of the uh, USPSTF, United States Preventative Service Task Force, um, where we uh, undertake systematic reviews. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, patient uh, advisories and uh, qualitative work uh, with patient panels to develop uh, not only guidelines for primary care practitioners who are doing work around screening and prevention, uh, but also develop uh, shared decision-making tools to help uh, physicians and, and patients together arrive at some uh, best decisions in a joint manner, uh, especially when, the, when, the, when, the, when the, the research is often uh, challenging to interpret and the uh, balance between benefits and harms is not always clear. Also, to get to do some great teaching uh, at the New York Academy of Medicine and some other workshops. And if it's not already clear, I'm kind of big on grade and have been referred to as a grade, as a grade geek by some of the people uh, who know me. 
But I think you, you should know that when I'm in my presentation, uh, I haven't really been, I have not been involved in the development of the creation of the evidence to decision framework. Uh, have not been part of that, of those papers in particular. I'm really speaking to you from the perspective of a methodologist or a guideline a supporter who has been using the evidence to decision framework now for a few years and thought um, the feedback that I'm getting from the guideline panels is so unique and generally so positive that that might be a good thing to share with you uh, on this webinar. Uh, so let's get going then on the uh, meat of the presentation. First concept I want to kind of share is something that I've kind of observed over years and years of being involved in evidence-based medicine. And I guess I kind of think of this as a swinging pendulum and how in a way we started at one extreme that I'll make clear in a, in a couple of minutes, gone to another extreme and maybe the evidence to decision framework represents something of a more balancing out of, of those two extremes. So this is what I mean. Um, are, are folks familiar with the um, well-known uh, methodological approach for guideline development known as the, the GOBSAT? GOBSAT, it's, there's not too much literature on it. Um, it's, it's, uh, I mean, maybe I'm giving something away by the, the age of the photo here, but um, this is one of the early iterations of how at least it's perceived uh, that guidelines were developed. And GOBSAT in, stand, in fact stands for good old boys sitting around the table. And uh, I think one of the reasons that uh, we saw the work from the Institute of Medicine and one of the things that pushed uh, forward a more rigorous approach based on a systematic review uh, as, as the core and, and essence of, of a clinical practice guideline, as it should be and it should st still could, should continue to be, is that we were trying to move away from this uh, opinion-based expertise, uh, co commonly biased and influenced by both intellectual and financial conflict of interest approach. But I think now that we've gone to the very extreme of only limiting our analysis and our, uh, our guideline processes to the systematic review, we've lost something in the shuffle. And that's maybe something I'm going to clarify with this next slide, is that oftentimes uh, we <coughs> find that although we've asked a great question and we know there is some research to inform that question for a guideline panel, uh, we, we, I think, often come to the realization that there's actually a lot more to the creation of evidence-based recommendations than the evidence alone or just the systematic review. There's rich input that can come from other forms of research, other kinds of information, other perspectives, which can actually create a much richer, much more informative, and much more useful guideline. So while, of course, sometimes we do see, uh, on occasion, robust randomized control trials as an example that can be a strong driver or can inform uh, a recommendation from a guideline panel, that's actually more uncommonly the case. And for those who are using GRADE, you'll certainly be aware that for groups that transition to the GRADE framework, uh, the number of strong recommendations uh, drop significantly when people move to grade and end up much more often with a conditional or a weak recommendation. So as my uh, mentor in evidence-based medicine, Dr. Peter Weyer from Columbia, who's also a member of Gen, Gen Steering, has told me, uh, oftentimes the research evidence turns out to be sort of a minor player or a bit player on the, on the stage of guideline development and evidence synthesis and making recommendations. And it's really some of those other factors that are probably uh, more in, in need. But still, the guideline movement moves on. Uh, we, there's a clear desire for guideline groups to get together, analyze what's out there, and come to rational, clear, explicitly derived and transparent uh, recommendations as has been outlined th 
through the Institute of Medicine and which uh, the GRADE process hopefully tries to facilitate. But what I find sometimes with panels is that there's sometimes a little bit of frustration for having to let go of some of the uh, qualitative and observational research, which doesn't fit the PICO question necessarily, but can still be a very informative source of information when it comes to providing guidance to stakeholders and end users. So here we are at a point where I'm going to do something a little bit different, uh, take a, hopefully take advantage of the interactive potential of this webinar. And if you could uh, have a look at this question, I want you to think a little bit, uh, and I've kind of danced around it without being explicit about it, but what do you think in 2018 a guideline panel should be thinking about um, that would inform the strength and the direction of a recommendation related to some aspect of uh, healthcare delivery or some kind of healthcare intervention. And um, of course, so and please use the chat box to, uh, to type in some thoughts and we'll, we'll maybe take a minute for people to think that through and, and type in uh, what their ideas are. So of course, um, there is uh, the, the research itself, but what else goes into it? All right, well, thanks. Uh, great from Daniel and, and Helen, thank you. Uh, an overall of patient values comes up, uh, a consideration of, um, of benefits and harms, wonderful. Uh, there's registry data, um, how the, the public would view um, these interventions. Wow, fantastic stuff. Yes, capturing patient values and preferences and, and how this plays out in the real world using real world evidence, which can often uh, inform the, uh, the practicality of, of an intervention and the feasibility of it as well as the acceptability. That's amazing, great stuff. Um, someone talked here about the, Danette talking about the burden of treatment and adherence to patient values. Yes, anyone following Dr. Victor Montori and the patient revolution is certainly going to be uh, careful about uh, thinking about those things, which unfortunately are not often captured in the seminal randomized controlled trials that address a given intervention. Um, in fact, in general, the harms of an intervention are generally uh, not often as well captured as the benefits uh, from much research. Uh, safety issues, and I'm glad a couple of people have pointed out here to cost. Uh, we can no longer be cost agnostic or, reason, or, or, or ignorant or head in the sand when it comes to a consideration of the resource implications uh, of what we're recommending. We can't make these recommendations in a vacuum uh, because those will of course have significant implications on both a low, moderate, or a high resource setting. So great stuff. Um, super. So one of the things that um, is also, I, I think that you're getting at in your great list of uh, suggestions here is that um, it, it, someone brought up the idea of ethics. I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that, but one thing for sure is that some healthcare directives or recommendations, especially a strong, the occasional strong recommendation, which can translate into a QI indicator or a standard of care or a mandate, can have serious implications on elements of health equity and can actually uh, have an in, unintended consequence of increasing the disparity between uh, those who have and those who have not, whether you think about that in socioeconomic terms or in terms of uh, geographic location, or if you think about that in terms of vulnerable, uh, socially marginalized populations. So you guys have just hit it out of the park when it comes to this brainstorming around what else should inform a recommendation. And it's a great segue for me to talk now about how the evidence to decision framework tries to capture 
both research evidence that may not be directly related to the guideline question, but is certainly relevant, as well as panel perspectives, insight, and expertise to reach a much richer and well-rationalized and justified recommendation. So in the evidence to decision framework, these are the key questions that a panel is asked to address. Uh, it begins with a sort of a general consideration of, you know, what are we talking about here? Are we talking how much of a health issue uh, are we trying to address with this guideline? Is it, uh, is it a major source of morbidity and mortality, or is it uh, only affecting certain populations? Um, how, do we, how do we quantify as best possible the burden of disease and the opportunities for improvement? And uh, for those of you who are, are following grade methodology, it's really ultimately all about the balance between benefits and harms associated with an intervention because um, if the benefits greatly exceed the, the harms and the downside, then uh, that does generally get an end. The end were supported by moderate to high certainty in research evidence most of the time that gives the panel a bit of a green light to make a, a, a strong recommendation. And just as an aside, um, my, it seems to me from the work I've done with guideline panels is that my main job is not to explain grade. It's not to uh, explain why you want to downgrade for indirectness or some other technical thing. No, my main job is to rein in the enthusiasm of the panelists who, by their very nature, want to make strong recommendations that often place the uh, evidence, the, the research cart ahead of the recommendation horse, and are often hopeful to make uh, strong recommendations that will impact practice when, in fact, um, they may not really be in a situation that uh, endorses that approach. And so um, we now, uh, with guideline groups, are talking about resources and costs and cost effectiveness. Uh, I mean, if we have the luxury of a well done uh, cost effectiveness analysis that's relevant to the context of the guideline, uh, we're very lucky. Uh, often that's not the case and we need to do more of an empiric approach to thinking about uh, cost. Sometimes uh, the answers are usually quite evident and straightforward, and uh, the panel can usually readily identify those interventions that are cheap, easy, and, uh, and, and, and safe versus those that are much more costly. Um, and panels who don't ordinarily get into the habit of considering costs and resources do so with a fair bit of trepidation because they feel in some ways that they're going beyond the evidence-based framework and delving into uh, areas that are not uh, all that well supported with research. Finally, we want to also think about, and this is particularly valuable, I think, once a guideline comes out and heads to, to end users and stakeholders who must decide on the implementation strategy, is what evidence do we have? And again, it's, it's, we try to go above conjecture and above opinion and try to actually pull out some, some studies uh, that address this, even though um, we may not be doing so to the same rigor of a systematic review, but a, a lot of research can inform or personal experience can inform the issues of feasibility, acceptability, and it's often a really fascinating exercise to think through how uh, a recommendation either for or against an intervention can heighten or mitigate uh, disparities in society. But what's missing on this list, and which came up right away from your uh, brainstorming answers, was the idea of values and preferences. And that's so critical um, in, in, in this day and age of uh, guideline development. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the strong recommendation supported by high or moderate certainty in evidence using grade language is exceptionally rare. What that leaves us with 
is conditional recommendations. And the conditions specifically that will draw a clinician to either encourage or order or prescribe a given intervention for a patient will, will turn around that, how that patient values the various outcomes that are, we're talking about um, and, and the consequences of doing or not doing a particular test. I mean, an example that, uh, come, that we've been talking about quite a bit at the Canadian Task Force is, of course, PSA screening, prostate-specific antigen screening for, for, for prostate cancer. Uh, we've held off on making a strong recommendation against. It's a conditional recommendation against. And we're opening the door to a shared decision-making approach and uh, creating 1,000-figure pictures showing a, a, a man in the age range of PSA testing uh, what their likelihood of uh, benefiting from prostate screening is, their reduced risk of uh, prostate cancer death, which is quite tiny, their overall mortality benefit, which is essentially zero, and their um, risk of incontinence and infection and um, erectile dysfunction, as well as the likelihood of being overdiagnosed, i.e. having a uh, cancer identified that would have never caused them any concern and had, would have remained asymptomatic for their entire lifespan. So once you uh, have a better sense of values and preferences, you're in a much better position to operationalize a conditional or weak recommendation either for or against, and those are now increasingly common. Um, and I'll show you a bit more about that uh, in a little bit. So um, this is kind of the uh, messaging around the evidence and decision framework and its uh, structure and its ability to actually um, capture all of these elements. Uh, we need to go, the thinking is, is that we need to go beyond uh, the systematic review, and, and maybe we always have, but now it's a bit more uh, clearly stated, explicit, and transparent. We need to consider the comprehensive balance between uh, benefits and harms. Uh, I, I would add that one of the advantages of the evidence decision framework, and I'll demonstrate this when I show you uh, how the tool works within the Grade Pro software, but um, the idea is to capture the rationale, capture the discussion, capture the points that were made which drove the judgments that are all part of the evidence decision framework. This doesn't mean that these are the right answers. Uh, it just means that you'll have a clear line of sight as to how the panel arrived at their decisions, how they judge the various components, and it allows uh, a local group to take those uh, decisions and say, well, that's fine and dandy for this group that created this guideline, but when it comes to feasibility, they judged it as likely feasible, but we know that in our context, it is not feasible and that can allow a clear basis for uh, rejecting a, a, a recommendation that's come down the line on an existing guideline. So a lot of this is not strictly speaking evidence-based because it may not all be systematic review type research. Uh, a lot of it can come from, as I mentioned, uh, registry data perhaps, observational studies, focus groups, qualitative research, as well as panel uh, insight. And uh, especially, uh, as I've learned, especially with the sickle cell group that I've worked with at ASH, a uh, really invaluable perspective from the patients around the table who have uh, been the drivers of many of the judgments in the evidence and decision framework and have helped us reach um, some consensus quite easily. And also, um, when we do tackle the acceptability, feasibility issues, we often get some real neat tips from people around the table as to how they did something. Um, I recall working with the, the North American State EMS organization on a guideline related to mitigating the risk of fatigue among paramedics. And we talked about uh, the intervention related to allowing naps 
by paramedics while they were on duty to uh, reduce fatigue and the implications that would have on scheduling and covering um, the territory for EMS calls and not uh, margin uh, and not leaving certain neighborhoods without EMS coverage. Uh, some of the EMS leadership that was on our panel uh, shared their experience as to how to successfully do that without um, having to add extra ambulances onto the road. And that was all captured in the evidence to decision table. So most of you who follow the grade methodology will recognize this uh, graphic. Um, the upper blue panel speaks to all things related to the synthesis and the, the synthesis of evidence, the creation of the well-validated uh, evidence profile table, and the outcome-centric focus that is grade. Everything that is pink uh, now is about the panel input, the discussion, and the use of the evidence to decision framework to consider not just the certainty in the evidence, but all of those other things that we're, we've been discussing, such as uh, the balance between benefits and harms, uh, resource use, and acceptability. There may be a color issue, <laughs> But the top half is blue, and as far as I see it, the top half is blue and the bottom half is pink and relates to the formulation of the recommendation and uh, consideration of the evidence to decision uh, components. So um, just to let you know that I'm not making this stuff up, this is a screenshot from the GRADE Working Group website, which... Um, uh, has public has put on their homepage the six elements that are required for someone to say that they are using this the grade system and um, I won't go through all of this but just point out that in number five it says clearly that in order to use grade you need to um, use something you need to ideally use the evidence to decision framework or, or something related, which clearly maps out the process, the considerations, the factors that were taken into account as the panel moved from an evaluation of the research evidence and to walk that very tricky but so important uh, pathway from evidence to recommendations. And in fact, that's often the failing of uh, many guideline panels is that uh, and one of the criticisms that's been addressed in the Inter Institute of Medicine report is that the, the, it's often a black box. We often do not see clearly how a guideline panel took these three studies, um, analyzed them for risk of bias, and put them in a grade table. How exactly did they get from that to their recommendation? And uh, the evidence decision framework uh, has limitations, but the one thing that I think is particularly helpful is the transparency and explicitness. Uh, and many groups are now publishing the evidence to decision table as an appendix uh, to their guidelines so that uh, end users can see how things played out on, very, on all of these various uh, parameters and domains. So how do you do it? Some of you uh, may know about the uh, Grade Pro software. I have no, uh, this is a free access software. I have no involvement in this. I understand uh, it's uh, been created through a grant from the European Union and is free to anyone in the world to use. It's actually quite sophisticated and um, really helps guideline panels uh, develop their work. And uh, increasingly, what I'm doing and other guideline methodologists who use GRADE are doing is that the guideline panel works directly through the evidence, pro the evidence decision framework uh, in a live online way during the meeting and walks through the various questions and considerations. It almost serves as an agenda and a recording tool to capture the major points and ideas. Of course, it's ideally pre-populated in advance with research uh, and input from panelists that speak to the various uh, com components. And so once you set up your account, um, 
uh, what happens is that the research evidence auto-populates uh, into the uh, evidence to decision profile so that while you're reviewing the issues around benefits and harms and the balance between the two, you're always reminded of what the evidence is showing and what uh, the effect sizes are, the confidence intervals are, and most importantly, what is the certainty of the evidence going from very low to low to moderate to high as per grade. And this is a screenshot showing an example of that. Sometimes we get stuck. Um, well, first of all, maybe I'll just show you that this is the latest interface of the evidence decision framework. And uh, basically the way it plays out here is each of these um, components that we've been talking about, like equity and acceptability, all appear on this long web page. And the purpose of the goal of the panel, and, and often I think I, 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 if, if with good preparation you can get through, uh, if it's not too complex a question, you can get through an evidence decision framework in roughly an hour. But uh, for example, here's the equity question. Um, and the panelists now need to think whether the intervention uh, they're thought, thinking about uh, recommending for or against would reduce equity uh, by increasing disparity, or it'll be probably reduced or definitely reduced, or there wouldn't be an impact, or equity would be increased and uh, it would bring more fairness to the table, or, or it would definitely do the, or you, the panel can also say, well, you know, it depends. Uh, it, it'll depend on the context. It'll depend on the, con, con, uh, the, the, um, the population. And you can spell out those uh, conditions or, what, where, or how, it would, how equity would vary across a different context so that uh, the reader of this table can see what you are thinking. But if you're still stuck, you can press on this detailed judgments button um, and what happens is a new interface opens up which asks more granular and more specific questions that taken together can help inform the equity piece. Uh, and and uh, many of the other domains within the evidence and decision framework, uh, be it um, certainty in the costs, cost effectiveness, all have these uh, detailed sub panels that can open up and help the panel do the more detailed work and inquiry required to complete the table. So once you've gone down these more detailed questions about identifying groups that could be disadvantaged, plausible reasons for anticipating differences, you can get a final judgment as to whether uh, the guideline would in fact uh, be uh, increase or reduce the effect of, uh, of, of equity. Would, would have enhanced or reduced equity impact. Okay, I think I've got to put that back. And so once you've walked through all of these dimensions uh, in the evidence decision framework, um, everything gets kind of collated into this summary of judgment table, which uh, my experience has been that the uh, panel likes to look at for uh, quite a while and likes to debate and talk about and oftentimes we change our judgments as we look through this and it gives you a kind of a global picture of how the panel has weighed in on the size of the extent, the, the degree of desirable and undesirable effects in sort of qualitative terms, certainty of the evidence, values, the balance between the two, cost considerations, equity, I couldn't fit it on the screen, but uh, feasibility and acceptability are, are just down a little bit further. And then taken all together, uh, I, I'm finding that the panels are now quite comfortable looking at all of these things together, integrated with the evidence from the systematic review to come to usually a quite a readily a consensus on whether they should be recommending in favor of or against and whether that is a strong or a conditional uh, recommendation. Lots of cool uh, re research and papers coming out on uh, the evidence and decision framework. This is, I think, one of the first one from last year, uh, talking, introducing the concept and, and bringing through the idea of grade allotment. 
which uh, speaks to the concept of how a local group, even perhaps at the level of a clinic or a hospital, can take the work of an existing uh, systematic review team or an existing guideline panel and use the evidence to decision framework to adopt uh, a given body of evidence to their circumstances, walking all through all of those evidence to decision criteria, or to do it a de novo if they have those resources. And, and this is just, again, a reminder and a reiteration of what are the key elements that you would still be considering in an ad allotment type uh, process. Uh, so it, this is ideally going to make things more accessible to um, under-resourced settings who are clearly being mandated to create local guidelines but may not have the wherewithal or the resources to invent to invest in the evidence synthesis de novo. But if, uh, if, if they, they were to share or borrow from an existing evidence profile table, um, it's not high science or very, very difficult to do um, the evidence to decision framework, which is available in, in approximately 12 different languages on the online tool. So we talked a little bit about um, values and preferences. Uh, and uh, sorry about the black con background here, but this is a, an, an, an emerging body of kind of literature which um, undertakes a systematic review of the evidence around values and preferences, drawing from qualitative research, survey studies, whatever they could find uh, that helps identify patient subgroups and, and their perspective on the risks and benefits of an intervention. Here we talk about screening, PSA screening for prostate cancer again. So, um, I mean, if, if you are lucky enough to be working on a guideline where there happens to be a systematic review on values and preferences related to the topic, well, your money. Uh, and you can plop that into your evidence to decision framework. Uh, I think, as, uh, maybe I don't know if I noticed, pointed this out as well, but w the way the cells are structured is you're encouraged to put research evidence primarily into this box right here. Uh, so this is where you would put the, uh, the systematic review on values and preferences and summarize it and reference it. And here in additional considerations, I think this is really where you capture the wisdom of your panelists and the perspectives and their insight, uh, be they the patients or um, the, um, the other kinds of people that you felt are necessary to create a multi-stakeholder panel. This is also, by the way, where you would capture dissenting views. If someone just doesn't go along with the idea that equity is increased or decreased uh, and has a good and has a re and would like to have that recorded in the evidence and decision framework, you can put that dissenting view uh, in there. So uh, I'm going to call it uh, to an end quite shortly because I hope there's lots of questions and discussion. I'd love to hear from folks on the call who have used the uh, evidence and decision framework and want to share their concerns or ideas or, or tips on how to use it better. But um, my take on this, and, and I see it in the light bulbs, the virtual light bulbs on the faces of the panelists, uh, it's, it's trepidation at first, but once they see where we're going and how we're building a much more comprehensive landscape of, of information to support a recommendation, they're, they're usually quite happy to know that um, everything is that not everybody's going to agree with them, but at least everything will be laid out in a clear and transparent way, and uh, they, they will be able to point people to what happened and where to go if, in fact, they are in looking at some criticism or questions related to the end product of their guideline. Um, it, it, it's a place where you can put the extra evidence that's not part of the patient intervention comparison outcome. Uh, that drives the primary uh, research question and systematic review that is the substrate for a clinical practice guideline. Um, 
and, and you know, uh, everything is fair game. Um, if, if there's a great patient story that highlights uh, an issue, whether it be around attitudes or uh, the educational needs, um, that, that is, that is uh, certainly fair game for the evidence and decision framework. There are also a number of cells uh, at the bottom once you've reached consensus, hopefully on your recommendation, where you can inform uh, quality indicators, uh, how to monitor uh, a group that was following through on this recommendation, and importantly, um, where are the research gaps and where should the research priorities be? Uh, so that's a great place for that to live. So uh, as I pointed out, uh, this could be great fodder for framing a shared decision-making process and um, shared decision-making tools can draw from the insight that you would find inside an evidence decision framework. And uh, through ad um we can have it seen as a process to take what we know is mountains and mountains of time and work and hours in creating a systematic review of a guideline and hopefully with a fair bit of efficiency um, to have a local uh, group. Um, I'm, I'm doing some work with some folks in Brazil looking at this to hopefully have them use the Portuguese version of the evidence and decision framework to make their own transparent, locally applicable, locally relevant recommendations. And, and you know, the, I mean, the, the, it is great to see these systematic reviews of values and preferences, but at the end of the day, what matters is the patient in front of you, perhaps more than, uh, than what the global evidence on uh, three focus group studies and um, other kinds of qualitative work can inform. So, um, thank you so much for, for your attention, and, and I'm um, happy to help clarify anything or uh, start handling questions. I see the first one there from Laura, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I think that's uh, that, that, that going to be it for now. Uh, Yurado, do you want me to start moving in uh, sure. on that I have a question as well, so let's start with Laura's and give people a chance to submit questions on the lower left of their screen as you're seeing one um, from, I don't know if everyone's seeing one from Laura, but um, it's just type in your question and Eddie will have access to it. Thank you. Go ahead, Eddie. Oh, did you have a question for me, Yorada? Yeah, I was going to ask um, about, uh, I, I'm tangentially familiar with a pilot project that I think you're involved in about the um, a domestic violence project related to the development work. And I was wondering if you could share some learnings or observations from that. I'm not really sure what phase of the pilot it's in. But oh, it would for be a sure. good example to bring up here. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, thank you so much for asking. Um, so in Alberta, uh, we have uh, run into a bit of a conundrum around screening for intimate partner violence in the emergency department. So we have a couple of opposing tensions and forces going on. We have uh, a government mandate essentially saying that we should screen in the emergency department for intimate partner violence. Uh, that's coming from advocacy groups and uh, harm reduction and a number of the government agencies that address this. Uh, because we know that uh, patients who come to the emergency department are at risk for intimate partner violence. On the flip side, we have emergency departments who are not, are, are only about 20% compliant with that mandate and who feel that it's often difficult to do, it's out of scope for emergency care, and uh, the resource required are quite significant, and there's often not a way to, um, to, uh, to, to refer these patients on, even if you do identify that they're at risk for intimate partner violence. So um, to, to solve this, uh, we got together and used uh, grade adelopment to try to sort things out. And I, I, I think it's neat how this played out uh, because what we had was actually a number of systematic reviews. We had uh, guidelines from the WHO, from the CDC, from the USPSTF, um, all coming to fairly similar conclusions. That is that 
screening for intimate partner violence in the emergency department certainly identifies people who are at risk. But there is no evidence yet, or there's no high certainty evidence that this identification will um, lead to better outcomes or lead to uh, safer outcomes for patients or better clinical outcomes or fewer uh, incidents that, uh, or, or safer, a safer trajectory for patients. So that was the, the nature of, in a nutshell, what the evidence was saying. And most of these guidelines actually came in and said that, you know, it's hard to know how they actually got here. Maybe they should have used the evidence decision framework, but they, they often recommended um, screening for intimate partner violence only among women of childbearing age. And, and presumably that's because uh, that's a well-known high-risk group. So we used great ad allotment to uh, work through that. We had a huge meeting, a fairly good-sized meeting with about 40 representatives, patient, stake, patient representatives, um, uh, ministerial people, physicians, nurses, uh, the, the, uh, the advocacy groups. Everybody was in the room, and we distributed the evidence profile tables in advance, presented what we were going to be doing with the evidence to decision framework and thought we would hopefully get together and reach a consensus. And the good news is that we did. We did. We, even, even the eMERGE folks who were skeptical about the benefits uh, felt that um, all told, the benefits of screening uh, outweighed the risk because there was no harm signal. That's very important. And we chose in, in a complete 100% consensus to suggest, that's code word for weak recommendation, to suggest in favor of universal screening. So not just high-risk patients uh, like childbearing age women, but all uh, adults should be screened for intimate partner violence. And that's despite the fact that we know that um, it's not always easy to do, um, and that our current um, rate of adherence is quite limited, but we learned a great deal from some of the representatives at the meeting as to how they do it and how they achieve higher rates of, uh, of adherence and how they've organized their emergency departments to make sure that someone is available to follow up with someone who screens positive. So um, I hope that's okay, uh, Urato, but that's kind of a, a, an example that I've lived recently of how uh, the evidence to decision framework and a great ad allotment helped us in Alberta reach a consensus and a common direction uh, going forward on a, on a very tricky issue. Thank you, Ari. That was a great real-world example. So we're getting a, a number of questions. Um, would you like to read them directly or would you like me to present them to you? Sure. So I'll start with Laura's question. She okay. wants to know, um, could the ETD be used in developing checklists as guideline implementation tools? Um, I would say for sure. That's a great suggestion. Uh, what I would do, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm not thinking about this the right way, but uh, for example, um, you know, there are groups uh, like the uh, registered nurses of Ontario, Cancer Care Ontario, and other groups that have created some really sophisticated uh, guideline implementation tools that speak to, you know, the importance of identifying champions, setting the burning platform, uh, bringing together the right stakeholders, using the evidence to decision, no, sorry, no, what am I talking about? The, not the evidence decision framework, but the uh, knowledge to action cycle. That's a Canadian product that helps uh, guideline implementation. And uh, I, I think it would be brilliant in the, and thank you for suggesting this, but I think I'm going to do it in the future. When you get to the um, implementation considerations, which is one of the boxes in the evidence decision framework, go to town. Put all that stuff in there that you think would be useful to someone who wanted to implement uh, their guideline um, and either with modifications or as is, and then you're providing resources for implementation, which is going to be very helpful to the end user and quite honestly uh, often gets second shrift. And uh, as, as guideline panels often feel that their work is done when they get to the recommendation, to see that now um, they've got implementation considerations on the docket 
and need to provide some guidance in that direction, I think that only enriches um, what, what, the, what the end product looks like. So I hope that's okay, Laura. Please feel free to text me a follow-up if, uh, if you want some further clarification. So Aaron, um, have you had any experience with using GRADE for nursing practice guidelines? Um, yeah, sure. So Aaron, thanks for that great question. And um, what uh, I would say is that uh, I think my strongest uh, experience with uh, nursing-oriented clinical practice guidelines comes from my work with the Help in Kids group from Toronto. That's um, the Beauty Shaw and, uh, um, well, the Beauty Shaw's group and I forget it. Well, anyhow, they're, they, they are a passionate group about interventions that reduce the pain and the fear associated with vaccination. And that's almost always nursing targeted type uh, interventions. So they've done systematic reviews of the literature on various interventions like sugar water, coddling, um, virtual reality, goggles, uh, you name it. Anything that can reduce the pain and fear of a vaccine in the hopes of increasing adherence. And they brought together a wonderful panel that have published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, Anna Taddeo. Anna Taddeo is the other person with the beauty. And uh, they have guidelines that address all this. Um, I don't know if I was using the evidence and decision framework that much at that time, but uh, we captured some of those uh, concepts for sure. And 60% um, of the clinicians around the table were nurses, and the target audience for that guideline was definitely nurses. So I hope that's okay, Aaron. And, and I don't know if it was, but I mean, it, doing guideline work with nurses is a is, <laughs> I don't want to get anybody mad, but like, nurses are a far easier and more open and accepting group to work with than certain physician groups. I, well, I'm going to get in trouble for that for sure. But, but physicians are, tend to be a little bit l more skeptical and less likely to uh, go down um, uh, a, a road of um, following guidelines, I guess. I mean, that's, maybe that's a terrible generalization. But uh, my, my most exciting work has been with nurses and paramedics, I would say. But there's, the docs do really well, too, so don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, so uh, Mary, is that your question there uh, about the implementation? So Mary's question, Mary says, does the framework support the implementation? That is, is it, yeah, for sure. Um, if the decision yields a recommendation against an intervention that had why, has had why, can the framework support how best to craft that type of recommendation? That's a great question, Mary. And honestly, I, I can't see why it wouldn't. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, there's such a positivist bias in a lot of these uh, projects. And it's all about doing more and doing more and doing more. But, um, I, I mean, I, I think if, if we saw, for example, uh, you know, right now the Choosing Wisely campaign is developed around a sort of a consensus-based approach where groups of specialty physicians decide uh, what five items are best considered carefully and reconsidered and maybe not provided. Um, if, if there was a more rigorous and evidence-based approach to that and it then pointed to the need for de-implementation, I don't see why um, we couldn't, you know, expand the scope of a project like that and do a more rigorous uh, search in, of the de-implementation literature, if you will, or, get, or, 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 you know, put some resources there related to the knowledge to action cycle and help inform end users if the recommendation is to stop doing something. Uh, again, it's about providing the resources and the tools and the guidance that will help folks achieve their goals. So that's a great question, and I, 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 don't, I haven't actually done that, but I think it's absolutely doable. Um, so Urata wants to know, do you anticipate the use of the evidence in other arenas such as medical technology reviews? It is, is it customizable to med tech reviews? And I presume that also means health technology assessment. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I don't see why not. Um, uh, you know, I think um, oftentimes uh, we, we, we do a lot of work with the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, and uh, their approach is fairly monochromic in that um, if there's, if it's not uh, a published study that matches their question, uh, they are not at all interested, uh, or it, it doesn't usually make it into the report. Um, you know, I can think of uh, a situation that we've approached them with uh, not too long ago. Uh, we have um, certain jurisdictions in Alberta where the intervention rates for kidney stones are very, very high, even though the kidney stones are small and would pass spontaneously. We asked them to do a review on the benefits of surgical interventions for small kidney stones, um, and they came back with, uh, there is no evidence. There's never been a study that meets your criteria, and um, there's no evidence to support that practice. I mean, it would be great if they took that one step higher. Uh, I think the, the, they, they, their reports are going out to physicians, they're going out to provincial health governments, um, I think it would be very valuable if they had the interest to undertake a broader take on that and include the, the people, the, the stakeholders who could not only um, address this, but maybe now sort of maybe tacked on to Mary's question, start thinking about, okay, well, what would you do now if there's no evidence, um, what, what, what decision-making tools would, should doctors work with uh, to help patients decide if they need an intervention, how should uh, referral rates for uh, patients going being sent to surgeons for intervention be monitored? So I think there's huge potential there if there's an interest on the health, on the part of health technology assessment agencies to go down that road because it's a bit I think it's largely uncharted waters for them. That's absolutely relatable to our work here. So thank you for that. Um, so, Eddie, are you seeing a number of questions from Tom Oliver as well as Mark Fung? Definitely Mark Fung. Um, okay. I'll, I'll start with him. Um, so, how are patients using guidelines? A patient rep as an N of one versus representative for a larger group as a stakeholder. Um, yeah, so that's a great question, Mark. And it's one of the conundrums that I think guideline panels are feeling in the sense that uh, clearly we want the patient voice uh, and we want that input all the way upstream to the formulation of the question and to the selection of the outcomes. But the, the, the issue is all around um, representativeness and whether uh, the um, and and whether um, the patient who you recruited um, doesn't have such a particular narrow take that it might unduly influence the whole process. So uh, I don't know if there's a great answer for this. It's um, uh, I think I think it's a kind of a combination approach that probably works best. Uh, I'm convinced that it's super valuable to have a patient there, but um, I think the patient also needs to be carefully selected, and it also needs to be made clear that there will be a pursuit of other sources of patient perspective, uh, presumably from qualitative research, that will inform the discussion and that will complement or, or provide synergy to the patient's voice and not simply... Um, uh, and not simply in, uh, in to, to have it be that one person or two or three people uh, dominating the discussion. So that's a great, great question, and I don't think we're there yet, but uh, we have some we have some ideas on where to take that. Um, uh, so Tom, I do see your question here. Uh, what are the successful uh, strategies for introducing grade to organizations or guideline panels that have not experienced the methodology before? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I mean, you know, conflict of interest alert. I mean, I do teach grade workshops, and this 
an answer might be construed as uh, benefiting that. But my, the experience I've had is that when I meet someone from, uh, you know, whatever it be, the, uh, the American Academy of this or the organization of this, they, they often, there's often like some vibe in the media or in the literature and, and there's, some, there's, a, there's often a feeling in these guideline organizations uh, or, or healthcare organizations, hey, what's, up? What's, all with, what's with this grade stuff and how come everybody seems to be using it and like what's going on here? Are we missing a boat? And if that discussion reaches a thir certain threshold, they'll usually send one or two people from the organization, especially those that are um, in charge of the guideline portfolio or the, or the, or the order set development portfolio or the, uh, or the uh, practice monitoring portfolio to uh, a grade workshop somewhere to see if um, this is a good fit for them. And um, it's not always a great fit, but, but, what often occurs is that um, when the people that I've, many of the people I've met that have come to the workshop say, oh, so uh, this is, they often come away with, oh, these, you've identified all of the things that are giving me grief and that I'm having trouble with in my organization. And it would appear that using the grade approach could certainly address some of that. So once you get uh, one or two people uh, familiar with grade, understand the benefits and what's driving the momentum behind it, um, it usually uh, is a good way of planting a seed and moving things forward has is, is been my observation. I hope that's okay. Um, so I could go, uh, so Tom, I can go back to, okay, so Laura, Laura's got a question on the acceptability to primary care who may need to use the checklist but do not use it now. So yeah, that's, that's a great that's a great question. And um, checklists are, uh, you know, uh, in some ways um, a, a great advance and uh, help standardize care. I, I presume you mean like a, a got an implementation checklist or something that you need to tick off if you're going to. Uh, go ahead with a particular uh, treatment strategy, make sure that you've covered all the bases. So, um, I mean, I think the best way to do this would be just to have uh, upstream buy-in. So if, if you are in a hospital and you're looking at uh, a grade exercise and an, ad an, an, an allotment perhaps, around um, a, a series of screening tests for patients coming into primary care and, and planning to develop that as a checklist tool. Uh, I guess if you, if you had the buy-in of the physician group uh, well ahead of time, and, and they may have some things that they would want addressed, so ease of administration, maybe some of the human factor engineer to make it simple to complete, or maybe some auto population from the uh, electronic health record. If you had the if you had them on board uh, early on, your likelihood of success is much higher. If you if you develop this uh, checklist using the gobsat approach, and then spring it on them at the end of the day and say now you guys have to complete this, um, even even if it's the exact same tool that would have come. Without, with, with their involvement, the fact that they've been engaged from the get-go and have ownership and approve the, 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 the momentum and the direction makes the whole world of difference, I find. I hope that's okay, Laura. Please feel free to send me a follow-up thought if, if you have one. Uh, so rapid guideline development. Yeah, Tom, you know, I, I have not. The answer is no. Um, so you're talking about rapid reviews and some of the work out of uh, Ottawa and David Mower. Um, you know, um, I, I, I have not had that experience, but I can't imagine that uh, it wouldn't apply. Because at the end of the day, although from what I understand from rapid reviews, there are some 
um, I would I, I hate to use the word shortcut, but there are some some efficiencies taken from uh, especially I think on the search side and perhaps the evidence evaluation side. At the end of the day, you end up with a body of evidence, meta analyzed or not, comprehensive or not, that is going to be the substrate for your trajectory from evidence to recommendation. So I think there's always going to be that caveat that um, it may not have uh, gone through the rigor of a truly fully systematic review, but we know full well that in times of crisis, uh, you know, with it, whether it be epidemics or, or Ebola or, or poisonings, we don't have the luxury of uh, the, the drawn out uh, six month uh, systematic review process. So I think it's certainly a, a test case that w is worth uh, drawing upon, and if and uh, if it were done, I think it'd be a great addition to the to the literature to know if that was possible. Um, great. How does Grade take into account and uh, the public comment? So great point, Mark. Uh, as you know, many groups are now mandated to post various aspects of their guideline development online for public comment. I know uh, in my work with the American Heart Association and the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, uh, as well as the American Society for Hematology, there's mandatory public posting and there's some really interesting feedback that comes there. Honestly, I don't think GRADE considers that within scope. GRADE is really more about um, evidence synthesis, prioritizing outcomes, uh, clear, clearly and explicitly evaluating and uh, summarizing the body of evidence across outcomes and helping panels get to a recommendation. But now that you raise it, um, I think it would be a perfectly reasonable thing to, uh, you know, when, when the panel meets and goes through the evidence to decision framework, if there are components of the public comment that fit into feasibility, equity, whatever the dimension of the um, evidence decision framework is, I think it'd be beautiful to put that in there because honestly, one of the challenges we have um, is, okay, what do we do with this? <laughs> what do we do with this input? Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really have a home outside of the web page where people type in their thoughts. So maybe this could be a new home um, if the comments align with a very uh, with a particular component of the evidence to decision framework. And uh, so that's great. And Laura, great, great. To, yes, the RNAO. That's the uh, the nurses of Ontario, I believe. Um, do I know anyone who is doing this already? We collaborate with to develop a clear, simple PAD checklist. PAD diagnosis. Is that peripheral artery disease? Uh, okay, well, no, I don't, uh, you know, when I, I think um, we, we, we ha well, I've been to some knowledge translation, knowledge to action workshops that uh, have focused on this and used the RNAO toolbox, uh, the knowledge to action model uh, based on uh, Ian Graham's work, uh, but have not I've seen anyone kind of go in the direction of checklists on this, but um, I do know some folks who might uh, be involved in this, and um, I'm happy to connect offline and see if we can uh, make some connections that uh, would enhance your collaboration. And um, so Jessica wants to know if there's a, uh, if for groups that, that don't, don't have the resources to do full grade, is there a modified version available? Well, you know what? Um, so there's a common perception that grade is a uh, complex, hard to get your head around, um, difficult uh, approach. But, you know, uh, the philosophy of grade has been very much to keep it simple and to keep it acceptable. I mean, you know, remember we've come from an era where uh, many guideline frameworks offer eight or nine different categories of recommendation, right? You've seen those, this is a 2B3, I mean, it's, it's hieroglyphics, it's, it's hard to 
even understand what the recommendation is saying. And grade has really simplified things. It's either you're for it or you're against it. It's either weak or it's strong. And there's only four buckets to put your evidence in as, as far as each outcome is concerned. Um, uh, so that is, uh, that is uh, low, very low, moderate, or, or high certainty. So what I would say, Jessica, is, um, I mean, the real difficulty is not the grade, the complexity of grade, it's the systematic review. And if you go back to the website that I showed you, which is the minimal criteria for using grade, they, although they state a preference, to do a full systematic review. It is not mandatory to use to do a full systematic review and call yourself grade. If you do a reasonable structured and reproducible search, um, whatever that is, with some uh, librarian input, and you identify four or five studies that meet your criteria, you don't have to do anything fancy with them. You can even use the grade evidence profile tables to create more, a more of a narrative summary of what those studies showed, you can actually, uh, I think grade could be quite accessible to you. So, um, you know, happy to chat with you offline, but uh, it, 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 I would say that especially if there may already be a published systematic review on your topic, you could get your head around grade in a very short period of time. So I hope that's okay. And how do you recommend guideline development groups address lack of consensus on how to interpret the content of the recommendation wording? Well, that's a great question, Melanie. Thank you for passing that along. Um, so uh, what we do uh, is we, we generally um, adhere to the 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 general rule of thumb as it relates to uh, guideline recommendations with grade, and if, if I've still got this right, uh, you need 70% of the panel, if, if you're going to even put it to vote, because uh, it's, it's, you know, I'd say it's way less than 5% of the time that you need to take things to a vote because you've reached a, uh, an impasse. But you need 70% for a strong recommendation for or against a pass, or a simple majority for a for a for a 50% uh, for for a weak recommendation. And you know, uh, my experience has been is of course, yeah, people have different views as you walk through the evidence and decision framework. And that's the beauty of the button called varies. So almost all of these evidence decision domain components have the word varies there as a choice. And, and then let's say if you took, talk about uh, cost effectiveness, you may have some people on your panel who will say, no, there's no way this is cost effective uh, and make their argument. And, or at least not cost effective in my particular situation or with, the, with what I have to deal with in terms of my system, my cost. Someone else may be diametrically opposed and say, no, this is no brainer. This is Obviously, good return on investment. We've got research to support it. Uh, this is definitely cost effective. So that's when you would choose the varies button um, and capture that discordance, capture that dissent, so say that it could that the cost effectiveness is likely context specific. And even if you have that disagreement, um, I find that you still get consensus on the final recommendation because it's rarely a game changer. It's rarely going to take you from a, a, a conditional in favor to a, a conditional against. Um, it might make the difference between a strong in favor to a conditional in favor, perhaps, but that's, that's rarely the case because often there are holes or gaps in the evidence. So um, it is tricky, and um, it does require attention. It, it also generates really fascinating and rich discussions that uh, the panelists really get into. But um, there is a way to manage uh, those disagreements within the framework. I hope that's okay. Thank you so much, Eddie. So I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. If you have any additional questions or if you think of something later on, you could contact Eddie directly or send an email to the address shown on your screen right now, which is 
gin-na at g-i-n.net. So Eddie, again, thank you so much for bringing to our attention such a useful tool to effectively take advantage of what you called rich information, which is absolutely true, outside of high-quality published peer-reviewed literature. So I hope everyone um, related to it and could use it in their, in their work. And we look forward to having future discussions about this topic as it develops further. And please remember to also attend our December 13 webinar. And if you, haven't, if you don't have the information to register, again, email the address you're seeing on your screen. So thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Eddie, uh, for your time today. Oh, it was a pleasure. It was really, really fun to do and uh, really thankful to the great questions and uh, comments and input of everybody who joined the call. Great. See you in a couple of weeks, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.